By virtue of authority vested in me as regent of Daniel H. Brush chapter of the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution, I now declare this meeting in session. Please stand and remain standing throughout the open ritual to perpetuate the memory and the spirit of the men and women who achieved American independence, to promote the development and enlightenment, enlightened public opinion, and to foster patriot, patriotic citizenship. These are the objects of our National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, Yes, I have a goodly heritage. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your abiding presence in the life of our country. We thank you for all those yesterdays of our human race whose lessons and fulfillments have become a heritage to us. Continue, we pray, your blessings upon this nation that all who are a part of it may learn true nobility of manhood and womanhood. Grant us growth in understanding and increasing devotion to righteousness. In your holy name, we pray. Christine, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Lynn, can you lead us in the American Spirit, please? I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, for the people, whose just powers are derived from the president of the government, and the democracy in America a sovereign nation of the sovereign states, a perfect union, one and inseparable, established upon those principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity, for which American patriots sacrifice their lives and fortunes. I therefore plead my duty to my country to love it, to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend it against all enemies. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, it's nice to see so many people here and joining us online as well. Um, I'd like to um, welcome prospective members and guests. Um, a very informative um, presentation. Um, by our registrar, um, Valerie Yildahouse, who is also my mother, for those of you that don't know. Uh, gene genealogy has always been a passion of hers growing up. Um, I used to give her a hard time about it. Um, but now as an adult, um, I am truly grateful um, that she does do this and I have a knowledge of my heritage and where I came from and have many patriots and other um, people have done some pretty awesome stuff for our history. So without further ado, Miss Valerie Gildahouse. Okay. Hey, I'm glad everybody, we had a great turnout. I know everybody's glad to get back and meet some friends in person again. We have several new people here and be sure you get my email address. The best way to give me information is email because then when I'm at my computer, I can look at it and make sure that I don't forget you. And if I do forget you, please send me one and say you didn't answer my email. That's not, I forget more than I used to. Now today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about, this will be a smorgasbord for everybody. People who have done a lot of research and I, Hope I'll have a few new tips for you, as well as people are just getting started. So then there's always more to do. So you could always go back over it. Let me look, make sure this thing is working. Okay, this time I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about DAR, because I noticed we do have several people both online and in person who could be potential members. And if you are interested, 
I would strongly encourage you to get in touch with me. And if you don't, if you have a patriot in mind, I'll check it out. Sometimes it's already proven, sometimes it's a lot of work. So, but I will help you find one if you don't know who, if you have one or not. If you or your family's been in the United States for a couple, at least a couple hundred years, and you don't know exactly where they came from, chances are very high that you have a DAR patriot, probably several. Now, the DAR was founded in 1890. Uh, for the first hundred years of our country, people were not real into heritage because we were getting rid of all that inherited title stuff. And that was not what we were self-made people and that's what they focused on. But then when they got around the hundredth year anniversary, there was a lot of renewed interest in your heritage and how our country became about. So that's how all these organizations started getting formed. And the DAR was formed to perpetuate the memory of ancestors who fought to make the country free and independent. Now at this time, as I'm sure most of you ladies know, when women were not allowed to join men's organizations. So they formed their own organization. It's open now to women who are 18 and over. And the DAR headquarters, which is in Washington, DC, it's right across from the White House area. It encompasses an entire city block and it is one of the largest building complexes, if not the largest building complex in the world that is entirely owned and run by women and has been since its formation. They do have a few male employees, but every, it's all run by women. Now there are three main focuses to the DAR. The historical, of course, to perpetuate our memory and spirit of the men and women who achieved American independence. And we need to refocus on that every little while. It's so critical that we do not lose that spirit. Educational, Washington said in his farewell address, that he wanted everybody to get a good education because that's the key to citizens who can participate. So that's one of our key focuses. And also, of course, to patriotic, to cherish people, cherish our veterans, and make sure everybody is, can have the same kind of blessings we've had. Okay, today DAR has over 190,000 members at the current time, 3,000 chapters across the United States and also internationally. To join the DAR, you must prove, prove lineal descent from a patriot of the American Revolution. That does not mean they had to be a soldier. They could have sold a side of beef to the army. And if you have a receipt saying they sold that side of the beef, then they were supporting the cause. They could have been a public servant, a town clerk, something like that, as well as actually serving in the military. Now, there's some of the things we do. We spend, DAR members spend millions of hours in local communities serving all kinds of stuff, especially the support of active military and veterans. I know Dorothy Rodoni, you've gone over for many years to the Veterans Center and made sure seeing how she could help the Veterans Center. So we do collect those hours and you get points for how many our people do. We also support and give small, they're not huge scholarships, but small scholarships to schools for underserved children. I know, in North Carolina, they have several schools that were founded back in the days when women did not get much opportunity to go to school specifically to help women in the mountains get an education, and those are still functioning. We give small donations to different, locally too. There is a DAR scholarship, but I'm not going to get into that, but there's a lot of different ways you can serve. And if any of you are interested in helping in these ways, be sure to contact our lovely regent, Ms. Caston. Now, if you're interested in joining, here's my email. And it's best if you send me, if you send me an email and write down what you have and what you're interested in, then I don't have to take notes and try to remember what you said. And then I will be happy to help you find a, a DAR ancestor. Chances are good we can find one. Now we did have, I think the longest hunt we had was for Gloria. 
she had a couple that uh, she had done a lot of good research, but she had a couple, and I had to tell her that those aren't going to work. Another name, man of the same name, that's almost definitely the line, not the one you had. But she finally got an 1812 pension record that gave her the link she needed. And once we got that, it was pretty easy. Okay, I, I like to say I'm a hybrid because most Southern Illinois was settled by Southerners and some Germans. Northern Illinois was settled mostly by people from New England and Germans and a few other people came later. But my mother was from Northern Illinois, so her line was almost entirely Yankees from New England. My dad was a Southerner, so his line goes back to the, all the Southern lines. So I've done, did a lot of research from the, early on, from the time I was 16, I've been doing this. And I've been, done research on both lines through the United States. And I used to teach American history. I always, when I learned about something, I would like, was my family there? Was my people involved? And, it, and if you find they were, it's so much more interesting. Okay, my mother joined the DAR in 1948, and I always planned to join, but as most people, they put it off. And I didn't actually join till 2010, and my daughter joined in 2013. And I've got three granddaughters that I'm more going to be getting to join before too long. <laughs> the DAR offers educational programs on research. Now, they're, they have recently reduced the price. They're now $75 a piece. They used to be like $125. And they're not, diff they're not that difficult. They, you can easily do them in a couple of months. But if anybody is interested in taking those and wants to, you know, I'm not going to be here forever and doing this forever, but we would be good to have some other people who are trained to do research and to evaluate. And if $75, if you really want to do it, but you think I just can't afford that, let us know. We can probably come up with a scholarship. Oh, and DNA, that's got more and more important in research. And I started, submitted my first sample in 20, 2005. So I, I'm not far from an authority, but I know more than most people about it, which doesn't take much. Okay. <laughs> now, when you have started about getting started, for people who have never done any research, first thing you're going to do is get either paper or forms, and I'll show you the forms in a minute. And you're going to start organizing what you know. Start with what you know. And as we say, to write it out on a piece of paper or the forms I'm going to show you, write it out on that. And then I like to put it in my own computer software on my own computer. And then I will also talk about how to do them online. The online stuff is very common now. Okay. Now. The file forms online. If you search for forms, you can find all kinds of them. There at the bottom, I have a website. This is familysearch.org, not .net. And they have everything you'll ever need. They have a lot of education programs, and it's all free. So the two you want to get to get started is a family group record form and a pedigree chart form. And I'll show you what those look like. Most of you already know, but some of you haven't seen these. Now, this is if you go to that on the previous slide. If you go to this website, then they're going to be down here. And this is all stuff to help to organize your information. But the family group sheets and the pedigree chart are down here. And if you click on that, it'll bring it up. This is the family group sheet. And what I like about this one is it's interactive. So if you have a computer, you can actually fill it in online because with all those sneaky little typos, then you can go back and change it later. So this is this one I can do online. You always pull it out by hand. And then save it. Make sure you give it a different name so you won't have replaced what you already saved. It starts at the top with the husband, gives his place and date of birth, then the wife place and date of birth, and then lists all the children. Now, the next one you want to fill out is the pedigree chart number one. This will be you. Okay. And then this is your father. 
this is your mother. You take your father, this is his father, this is his mother, and this is how you can trace your tree back. And you could have dozens of these. You go from the last line to then start another one. Now, things to remember when you organize, use full names. So when I put my name down, even though I go by Valerie Phillips Gildehouse, that's my maiden name, Phillips, you do, I put on this, my name is Valerie Jean Phillips. My birth name, that's what goes down here. And maiden names for women. Here's the date format that you should use, that all genealogists use this date format. And the place format, city, county, and state. And I would go to the place where you got the information, put like DC for death certificate, something like that. So, because you will forget. I mean, with the stuff I did 40 years ago that I thought, oh, I that, always remember that. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, first thing, and you can do this, even if you've done this before, you can do this again. Uh, look, records around your house. Fill as much as you can in on these charts or on your computer software, which does the same thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Get, find certificates, birth, death, and marriage. Bible records, letters, if they had, if they're signed and they have a date on them, those, that is a document you can use to document stuff. Photos, make sure you turn it over and look at the back. It might say where it was taken. Somebody might have written some, who it was and the date it was taken. Um, diaries and journals. I wish my family had, had kept some of these. But they do, sometimes you get really lucky and your ancestry had a civil war diary or something like that. <laughs> Obituaries, those are acceptable proof. So make sure you get the title and the date of the newspaper. Other newspaper articles that talk about family reunions. And anything else that you think has family information, if you gather this up, either put it in a box when you get started or start making file folders so you know where it is. After you go look around at what you know, you're gonna check with your relatives. Ask your parents if they're still living, siblings, cousins, aunts and uncles, see what documents they have. And ask them if they don't know, say, is there anyone you know that was kept these records that was interested? And you'll probably find a cousin or two, maybe somebody pretty far up that has kept records. Um, make copies of documents. If you cannot get, easily get to a copier, take a picture with your phone. Just make sure it's legible because it's frustrating if you've driven four hours and taken a picture of something and you get home and you discover you can't read it. Um, now, for example of how you think about it, think, well, who settled my grandfather's estate? And whoever settled his estate, if it's a cousin of yours, or whatever, they might have a copy of his death certificate. And take notes and record. You can do it so easily with your phone now. You can actually record what older family members said. If you don't want to record it, write the date, who you talked to, why you talked to them, and then details of what they had to say. Because in 20 years, you might not, you probably won't remember. Now, here's my genealogy software program that I like to use. It's Roots Magic 8, and it costs about $40, so it's not going to break the bank. And I like it because I don't trust internet. If the internet goes down and you don't have access, access to it, you're going to lose it. But I also like to print copies to keep in a file folder because someday they'll be doing something entirely different. Just like all those VHS tapes, nobody has, I have something to play in, but that's because I'm a hoarder. But <laughs> most people, if you have a VHS tape, people can't read it. So it is good to print this out in some form so people don't lose your research down the road a hundred years from now. Now, an online tree, this is where things have gone, and these are hugely helpful, but they also can be real nightmares. But Ancestry.com has a great site. It is kind of expensive, so some of you might find that it's a little out of your price range. But what I like about that is that you can link a DNA sample to your 
DNA sample, but your DNA sample to your tree. So then you can see who matched your DNA sample. And sometimes you can find that elusive relative that you're trying to prove their way back. There's a connection. Sometimes you can find it. There are several of these sites and they're all good. Now, my heritage is very popular. That's also a subscription site. You have to pay for it. That also links to DNA. I don't like that one quite as well because it's a little harder to get in touch with people. And I haven't used it as much, but they have all kinds of records too. FamilySearch.org, that's a huge one. That's uh, all free. But what I don't like about their trees is if you're going back, say, six generations, other people can change what's on that tree. They, and that's good in a way because it links them all together. And I found great stuff that other people had found, and it was good for my tree. But then I found my tree connected to something totally unrelated, and that's really frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> then you that also is all these are good ways to find others researching on your family. And they also, with the DNA, you can connect and see if your research, your DNA supports what you found. And I've had it go both ways. <laughs> OK, now, don't forget your local libraries. If you do not have the funds to get a subscription to Ancestry or Heritage Quest or My Heritage, your local library might offer you a chance to use that. Now, Ancestry.com, they have you have that here at the Carbondale Library. And then Carterville has it according to their website. But that's only available in the library. So you have to go to the library to use it. Heritage Quest is available in Murfreesboro and Carbondale. The, the nice thing about that, it has a lot of records online. And you can use it from home with a library card number. My Heritage is another similar site available in Marion and Carterville. Again, anywhere with your library card. Fold3, this is a great site. This is military records. And that you can act, Carterville is the only one of the libraries that I found that had that one, but you can access that online. And some of these I'll talk about a little more detail as we go through. SIU Library has lots of books and newspapers, newspaper on microfilm, some of which are not available at the archives in Springfield. So if your family was from mostly Southern Illinois stuff, it's worth going there and checking that out. Illinois Regional Archives Depository, that we have that the branch of the Illinois Archives here. It's out on University Press Drive, so it's a couple miles, a few miles from here. And they probably you'll have to call them and make an appointment there. You find them on the web. And you can go in and they have actual original records of many stuff. They also have a lot of microfilm. And on their website of the Cyber Drive, Illinois, they have a list of everything they have. John A. Logan College has a lot of stuff. They have books and newspapers. They, I think they still have family files. They used to have family files. So if your family's from Southern Illinois, you might go there and find that somebody has sent in research on your family. Historical societies, this is huge. Murfreesboro has the Jackson County Historical Society, great records. They have all kinds of original documents, family files, great research facilities, people that will help you. And Williamson County is in Marion. They also have a great historical society and I believe we're meeting there next month. So both of those are definitely worth a trip if you have any ties to Southern Illinois. And there's a Latter-day Saints Church. That's who sponsors the FamilySearch.org. They have a library between Carbondale and Marion. You probably have to make an appointment to go, see, go into that library. Elizabeth remembers being there. <laughs> Before we had all this internet stuff, you had to order microfilms to get records that weren't available locally. Okay, right on. Now, I made a list here of my favorite websites, and I think you'll have this up on the internet later, so you don't have to write these all down. <coughs> the first one I always do when I get a new work name is I just go to Google and do a search for that name. Put it in quotes. 
and add maybe a town if you know where they lived or a date of obituary, you know, if you know what year they died. Often you'll get all kinds of stuff just by using Google. Again, Ancestry, gets a great site. DAR has its own site. And they have great records and you can search those and see if somebody already has identified a patriot. And you can see much of the descendancy of people who have joined on that side. Family search, that's all free. A few sites link to sites you have to pay for, a few branch, but most of it is not. And I'll talk a little more about fold three. Oh, on family search, I think I'm gonna talk some more about that. They have a um, wiki search. So if you want to know about when did where they start keeping records in the state of Illinois, and you go and you keep Illinois death records in their, their wiki search, it'll bring up a page that will tell you all that stuff. Uh, National Archives, they, used, they were getting really good, but since COVID, they've sent everybody home and they aren't very good very, at the present time, but hopefully they'll get back to it. Pension records that are not available online, you have to get from the National Archives. And that's how we saw Gloria got them. It took her a while, but she got them and that solved her link to your Patriot. Uh, find a Grave, that's a great site. That's completely free. You go on and most of the information I found on there is good. I found a few that it's wrong, but you can post pictures. If you take get a good photograph of a web, of a gravestone, you can post it on there, tell where you took the picture and so forth, and then other people can use it. Make sure it's legible. If it's not legible, it's no good. And you can't use that information unless they post a picture of the gravestone, and sometimes they post a death certificate or maybe an obituary or something, and that you can use. Okay. Um, Newspapers, articles, I'm going to talk about different places to get those. There's a lot of that online. Genealogy Bank has a lot of newspaper stuff. Public Library, as I said, they have a lot of free. You can go and use their facilities to use this if you don't have your own subscription. U.S. Gen Web, that's an older site, but there's still a lot of good stuff out there. And if somebody was researching 20 years ago and they're no longer with us, you're not gonna find their stuff on Ancestry probably. And they may have posted a tree 20, 30 years ago on US Gen Web, or that they have county records too. Uh, Illinois State Archives Database, that's all free. And that's uh, CyberDrive Illinois, there's where you can find that. They have like marriage records, death records, different, lots of different things that you can get on there. And most states have their own websites. So I will talk a little more about the state stuff in a minute. Okay, now we're getting to those online family trees. They're great and they're also terrible. There's tons and tons of information to sift through. And they, some of it is just ridiculous. You have somebody born in Southern Illinois in 1840 and married in London and 1860, and you know, it's just, that's not how the migration patterns work. So you have to think about the migration patterns when you go through those. I've also found absolute jewels and links that I never thought I would solve on those. So double chose are clues. If they actually post a document, though, that you can use. Make sure you have the source, you know where it came from, like Jackson County, deeds or something like that, if you can find that or find out where they found that information, that you can use. And we'll go over a few of these, Ancestry, Family Search, Roots Web, they all offer different forms of family trees. Um, and to check them out, many older family histories are available online. And back in when DAR started in the late 1800s, People were publishing books this thick with family histories. And my cousin and I used to drive into Chicago to Newberry Library, which has a fabulous collection of family histories. And then you'd search through these family histories to see if you could find your family. And many of them were well done. And some people laugh at them, but they are, if you look through it, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, 
you can prove it and find out who source what the source is many times. Now the new ones that were published in the 1880s county histories, those are just clues because those usually do not have sources. My aunt told me that it's not a source unless you wrote notes. I interviewed my aunt on this date and you write down details of the date and exactly what she said, then it might be a clue, but for the most part, those aren't clues. Okay. Evaluating county and family histories. Now, this is always a big step. These pins get a little heavy. <laughs> <laughs> when you're evaluating a county history or family history, those big thick ones that they published, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s, if you can determine where the information come came from, that is a source that you can use. So you have to search through the book to find it. And I'm gonna show you why I did that on a couple of occasions. And what you're looking for. I had a biography in 1905 for my great grandfather, Winfield Phillips. And so I looked, it doesn't contain detailed information about a family with complete names and places and places. Now it doesn't have to have everyone in there, but if it, if it looks like whoever wrote this obviously knew this family, because they really, then, then you document like the census record can show that that's accurate. It was the information given to the author by living relatives who would have known these people. Did the author know the people? Sometimes you have an actual, your cousin wrote one, so you just need to identify who they are. And you have to get other documentation and make sure it does not contradict what you found in this county history. Now, here's one of my examples that my great grandfather, Winfield Phillips, 1905, he had a biography. Most of these biographies were in there because you paid, you bought a subscription, you bought their book, and then you sent them information and they published it. So the, unless there's detail, you know, some evidence to the contrary, in DAR, they assume that's what happened if it's a detailed family history. So this biography contains detailed information about Winfield's family, lists all his brothers and sisters, his parents and his grandparents and his aunts and uncles. So he was, uh, at that time, he was 51 years old when this was published and a healthy, still active man. So chances are very high that he is the author of this biography, even though it doesn't actually say that, DAR will accept that but you do have to support it with other documents like the census, the marriage records and so forth. And then if there's one or two dates or names that you can't find anywhere else, they will take it. Okay, um, and here's what you say. What would Winfield have known about his family? What would the average person know about their family? So they would probably know the names of their parents, all their brothers and sisters, who they married, Names of their grandparents, probably their aunts and uncles and oh, who they married. Not all of them maybe, but most of them. And sometimes a great grandparent. So just think with a, the average person who's not doing this all the time, what would they have known? And if that's in, in there, now when they get back to great, great, great grandparents, they did not, that is not firsthand information. So you could use that, but it is a clue to where you need to go. Okay, so then, as I said, you find census documents and other records to support the details that are in the book, find as many as you can, and then it will take some of the other details. Okay, here's one that I proved just recently. I just got this approved and I had to write a summary of how I did this. There's a book called The Pain Genealogy. It's written in 1881, so right at the height of all this, this researching of your family. And my cousin and I found the first couple generations on it are totally wrong. Oh, wow. You know, we were shocked. We thought at the time we started, we were like, oh, this is it. And she's like, that doesn't say, it gave sources. We looked, it didn't say that. Mm -hmm. But on the living people's generations and on who people they would have known, like their parents and grandparents, it had documented, it had records that we could not get anywhere else. 
So I was trying to prove that Zebediah Payne, born in 1751, is the son of Edward Payne of Foxborough, Massachusetts. Page 100 lists Zebediah and Joel as one of the children of Edward Payne, but does not give any sources. There's a list of all the children. And then when I go on, where they're going on to the, uh, the Zebediah and Joel's children, I find details on Zebediah and Joel and who they married and who their children were, where they lived, no sources. But on page 127, the author gave thanks to Berlinda Shaw, Payne still living for her contributions. And I was able to document her as the wife of Nelson Payne, youngest son of Joel Payne. So a Joel and Zebediah's wife submitted an application for a revolutionary war pension. And in that he identified names his brother, Joel Payne. So through this, I was, and Joel is a documented child of Edward. So through this, I was able to say, Belinda Shaw Payne would have known who Edward's children's were, children were, and they accepted this. She lived in the, Belinda Shaw Payne lived in the same area as her father-in-law, Joel Payne, her entire life. She would have known the names of Joel's parents and brothers. And that's what you want to focus on when you're asking them to accept this. So I found all I could to support this family and made a copy of it, and especially of Joel and his son, Nelson, and then the 1841 pension application of Zebediah's widow says they were married in 1778 in Staunton, which is now Foxborough, and that Zebediah had a brother, Joel. So I, then I had to write a summary that tied this all together because of this, this, and because of this, this, and that can prove a line when there's no solid documentation. Okay, books. You may get lucky, type the title into Google. Books before 1927 are public domain. So you can usually find those online for free and you can print the pages out. Make sure you print the title page, the name of day, the publication. Put the title in quotes is often helpful. Now this is several places you can find online books. So you can go through that at your leisure. Whoops. I just hit the wrong thing here. Yeah. Whatever we are. Both records. My hand fails. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's a lot of different places. It also toward the bottom is World Cat. That tells you what library has a book. And like I said, SIU has a lot. Johnny Logan has a lot if you're dealing with people from this area. And the local LDS church can order microfilm, but most of these you can get online if they're before 1927. Newspapers, lots of newspaper sites. Most of these are subscription sites. Newspapers.com, Newspaper Archive, Genealogy Bank are a few of the ones I use. News.google.com has newspapers. Obits Archives has recent archives. Most of these you do have to subscribe to to get them. Some papers have their own site, the Illinois State Library, the archives, they will make copies of obituaries for $5 each. That's now at the President Lincoln Library is it has where the archives are. Uh, University of Illinois has a huge collection, lots of interesting things there. Library of Congress has some newspapers. And SIU has a large microfilm collection of newspapers, particularly Southern Illinois newspapers. There's a few, I'm not talk much about land and places, but there are a lot of few places you can find land and records. Land records are key because if you see from the census, your family owned land, then they probably is a record of when that land was disposed of. Family search. Now, if you have not, how many have used family search? Okay, if you if you have not used family search, this is a great site and it's all free. A few pages linked to something that you have to pay for, but most of them don't. 
Okay, you have to set up an account. There's no charge. I find I have to log in every time. It says you can log in for two weeks, but you can't. But, um, so then on there is there's search, and then there's records. You can check the index or click on the map. Many records are not indexed yet. Now I do have, I didn't, a handout if you need it on how, a little guide on how to get on family search. And I didn't bring one today, but if you're interested, it gives you a basic getting started. It's not as user friendly as it could be. And the catalog, you can search for Jackson and then you go to Jackson, Illinois. It'll list all the stuff that they have on Jackson County. And as I mentioned previously, their research wiki, that you can say, where, you know, find out where state records were kept in Illinois. All kinds of other links there to different records to the area you're working on. This is the DAR site, Genealogical Research System. Now we've talked, if you've been in DAR, I've talked about that several times, but this is a great site. It is for people who have joined the DAR and have proven their line. And you can look that up and it is free. You can't see the first three generations so they don't show your name or your parents' name. I can see it, but other people can. And again, you can log, uh, if you don't have time to write this down, it'll be posted online. So you go in there and look at this. Oh, this is why I've talked about this before. You can order original copies of what was submitted from the DAR. I can see all the applications. So I can't print any of it out, but if you say, I think I have a cousin who joined and here's who joined, I can look it up and look at what they submitted and look at the original application and see what their sources were and let you know. I can't print it for you, but I can tell you. So and that's called image access. If you want copies, you have to order it from the DAR, which you can do too. And it's not very expensive. Not all Patriots are in the GS, GRS because if nobody's joined for that Patriot, it's not in there. Vital records, that's one of the things when you're first getting started, vital records is very important. DAR wants for the first three generations, birth, death, and marriage records. And they pretty much insist on this. Uh, these do not have to be certified. Just make sure when you get a copy that it's got the parents' names and it's legible. A lot of these are available on Family Search and also on Ancestry and other sites too for free. Now, Missouri, if you're looking for the state sites, many states have their own site. For example, Missouri, all the deaths, post records, certificates from Missouri from 1910 to 1971 are available online for free. You can download it, print it out, it's great. Um, both in death, these certificates in Illinois, you get it either from the county clerk or Department of Public Health. So you need to determine what county you're looking for and then contact them. The state archives, this is the link to the state archives. And I'll talk a little bit more about why you would use that in a minute. They have a form. Do not do the order online unless you wanna pay an extra $20. I don't wanna pay an extra $20. I print out the form and mail it in, and you can save that money. Usually in Illinois, I think it's about 10 or $15 now to get a copy. Uh, make sure you get the complete original that has the parents' names, and look for delayed births for people born before 1916. And I've got a few examples. In Illinois, birth records, you can, anyone can get them if they're over 75 years old. If, you, if they're not over 75 years old, you have to be entitled to it. A child, a grandchild, legal representative, that sort of thing. You have, you have to contact the county clerk. They usually give it to you for around here for like two bucks. Now, if you're dealing with Chicago, that's a whole different story. It's going to be a lot more expensive. Laws are different in every state. So you, if you're not dealing with Illinois, you need to go online to that Family Search Research Wiki and see what they say about when records are available and where you can get them. 
Now, this is just a, a few examples of things I have found. This is my birth certificate. My mother had this copy and it tells everything's on its fine. But I thought one day I should get a copy of the original from another, so I'd have another copy. So I ordered one. And as you see here, my name, my mother's name was Vera. So I got this from the state of Illinois or the state of Indiana, because I was born in Indiana. And it says my mother's <laughs> name is Verna Phillips. <laughs> now, if I was dealing with my great great grandmother's name, I would have thought, well, maybe she went by Vera, but her name was really Verna. But since my mother was very much alive, she, I knew that was not right. So I went over there this in Evansville and I said, this is wrong. And they said I paid $50 to make them so they correct it, which I'm sure my dad did, did 30 years ago, because they probably see, I kind of vaguely remember him on the phone saying that it's the wrong name on it. And here's what they sent me. It no longer has her married name on, her maiden name on. And they say, well, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> So for this, I would need, if you send in that Vernon, that's the only copy you had, fortunately I used the original, then you would have to prove that her name was not Vernon in some other way. So this leaves off her maiden name. I said, well, this is not worthwhile. I paid $50 and I don't, this is what I get. They make these stupid rules. In Illinois, they try to give you short, shortened versions of the certificate and it does not include parents' names. And then you have to tell them that's not what I want. You'll get it. Okay, uh, a few death records, the birth and death records were kept in Illinois by the county clerk's office from 1877 to 1916. Now I would guesstimate maybe 25% of the births got recorded, probably the vast majority did not, but you might get lucky. And the third one down, the one with the, this one, that's my grandfather. And it lists not only his full name and where he was born and the date, it lists his parents' names and where they were born. And the city that they were born in, not just the state. So for me, that was great. That was a great piece of documentation. Now, this is an example of a delayed birth certificate. When Social Security came out, there were lots of Americans who wanted to get on Social Security and they did not have the birth certificates to prove that they were the right age. So in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when they were getting on Social Security, they went in and filed. This was my grandmother's born in 1892 and this was filed in 1955. So that if you have that situation, it gives detailed information and that's something you can use. Here's an example of a marriage certificate. They were kept in, this gives again, my great grandfather, his parents' names and where they were born. So this is a really good, they don't often give this to you. You have to say, I want the one, this the marriage application with the names on it. Oh, and another thing that I've discovered, and I found this on two of great, great grandparents, this is what I got from the county clerk years ago, and it has the dreaded parents' name unknown. <laughs> so I had this for years. And then they started, they have an index of Illinois deaths, and it included hers, and it had information. It wasn't the actual record. So I wrote to the state to get the record. And the one that the state had, somebody had gone back and filled in the names of her parents and some more information on here. And the other interesting thing about this one is I would not have known this except my cousin lives in Elgin and she died at the state Northern Illinois Hospital for an asylum for the insane, which is where if you, those days no nursing homes. So if you can't find a record, if they got uncontrollable, and the family could not trust them, they sometimes ended up spending their last time in either the Anna or Elgin. And in this case, my cousin knew that was the address because she lives in Elgin and said, you know, she said she died at the insane asylum. Does not say that on that death certificate. Oh, if you count fold three, they have all the Revolutionary War pensions 
They have most of the War of 1812 pensions on file. You can see the originals and it's free. Now, now the Revolutionary War pensions are not free. You have to have a subscription. Uh, unbound index bounty land warrant applications. There's an index, it gives names, but you can't see the original. You have, they have an indexes for Mexican War, Civil War, but you must order that stuff from the National Archives. You search for the names on this, you have to be exact. If you search for Peyton Greer spelled this way, it will not bring this up. So you have to be creative with your spellings. Now this particular man was the brother of my ancestor. He died in 1847 at the end of the Mexican War. And his, his siblings, his parents were dead. So his siblings were his legal heirs. He filed, they filed an application wanting to get bounty land for his service, which he would have been entitled to, and it was granted. And in this application, it names the parents' names, all the brothers and sisters, and some of the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm just going to just about done here. Uh, DNA, lots of stuff that DNA does, and this is the future of really re re research. Um, some of you probably heard these terms and you might not know what they mean. Mitochondrial DNA is the mother passed from the mother to the daughter. And then the pink, on the far side here, the pink is the direct line for mitochondrial DNA. But because this mutates so slowly, it's not very useful for genealogy research. It can rule somebody out, but it can't necessarily rule them in. The other type, this is what Ancestry and most of the websites do now, is autosomal DNA. They trace both sides and then they give you ethnicity and degrees of relationships to others who have tested, which is very useful. Now, the only problem with this, with autosomal DNA, if you're dealing with close relatives, siblings, first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, chance they'll show up. But if you get down to fourth cousins, only a 71% chance that you share DNA. Fifth cousins, 32% chance. Sixth cousins, 11% chance. So don't think they're out of ways, they could still be your relative and you, they just didn't show up because they inherited different DNA than you did. Now, one of the ones I like to use, this is only offered now from Family Tree, <coughs> DNA.com is the Y chromosome. And the blue goes from father to son and it mutates slowly so it can be used to prove line. And DER expert accepts some DNA. But the Y chromosome, so I had to have my brother take the test. If you have a brother, an uncle, or cousin that's descended from that male relative, in one case, I tracked down a fourth cousin who was a descendant of the male line and asked him to take a test. I paid for it because I wanted to see so we could identify what Parker, a horrible name to research, <laughs> which Parker it was. So I strongly recommend that if you've got a brick wall. Now, again, this is kind of summing up. Go back and review what you collected. Go over everything like it's the first time you saw it. And here's a last year I decided I wanted to try to do a supplemental ancestor on my, this is for great grandmother, Sally Fails. Now I've worked on this line 40 years ago when we went into Newberry and I had it, you know, I thought I had the line and I knew she was born in 1766 in Norfolk County, Massachusetts. She married Robert Britton in 1788. They moved to Westmoreland, New Hampshire about 1796 and she had four children and I had all that stuff. And I knew he, re he remarried in 1809. So I assumed she was in her forties then, early forties. I assumed she died in childbirth, you know. So I started looking, documenting her father and lo and behold, I found her name as an heir of her father in 1811. So I knew she was not deceased. When I looked through the records, I found that she was declared mentally incompetent in 1812 and declared a ward of the state. 
and she was called a divorced woman in these records that name her husband and mentioned that she used to live in Westmoreland. She was back in Massachusetts. And I eventually found she was under guardianship for the rest of her life. She died in Vermont in 1832. So I wish I knew more about what the issue was, but I found so much more and I thought I knew all about her. There was nothing more to find. So good hunting. <laughs> yeah, and I probably was I too long, sweetheart. <laughs> okay. Well, we still have to see. Um, if you want a question, I suggest you email it to me because then I can at my leisure when I'm at my computer, I can go ahead and look at it and bring up the records and help advise you and any of you people that are non-members both here and on Zoom, please contact me if you're interested and we'll be glad to help you find a patriot. Any specific questions? One here. Oh, okay. Um, where is the best place to look for the correct name? Well, you have to be very creative for the correct name. When I first started, my mother's maiden name was Britton, B-R-I-T-T-O-N. So my cousin and I, we're in Chicago at Newberry Library, and we're like, this isn't spelled right. Well, here's what you have to think. They didn't ask how to spell it. So probably. So if it's spelled wrong, that doesn't mean they didn't know how to spell it. In the early records of my Ebenezer Britain, who is one of my patriots, it's always spelled B-R-I-T-A-I-N, I think. But it's spelled differently, but all the children spelled it the other way. And one or two went back. So you have to see if they actually signed a document and how their brothers and sisters spelled it might have been different for reasons we don't know or just because they were mostly illiterate. Lots of people were illiterate and that all they knew was how to write their name. So is there any, is there? Would you mind repeating people's questions before the Oh, yes, okay. Any, uh, yes. Any other questions? I think it's also important to note, and I know from the research with my grandparents, well, my, um, my patriot on my dad's side, um, that back in the early years, it was really, you didn't have to legally change your name. You could just change it. Um, and we ran into that with my great grandfather who changed his, or went by a different name than what was on his birth certificates and stuff like that. Yeah, his name was that. Well, his name at birth was Noah Robert Harvey Grant, but he never used Noah. And when I found him in the census, when my husband and I were dating and I started researching his family, <laughs> I found in, in the family and Nora was in the spot where he should have been. Well, obviously the census taker, they said Noah, because that was his actual first name. And they thought he said no and wrote that down. But I, for that case, I found a letter that he had written to a cousin where he explained how his parents couldn't agree on his name. So they called him Noah Robert after his two grandfathers and RB for arbitration. <laughs> and Grant was his last name. But when he went to school and went on and taught, he dropped the Noah completely. It's not on anything. And Germans, that's another tricky one. So the first Gilda House immigrant back in the mid-1870s or so, his name was Christian Rudolf Heinrich Gilda House. You almost no records as he found under the, he's found as Henry Gilda House. Almost every record he has is Henry Gilda House, one or two exceptions. And Germans were very fond of nicknames too. And some of them used the same. They might have Christian Rudolf Heinrich and Christian Rudolf Johann and Christian Rudolf, you know, something else, Adolf. So they did that sometimes. It was very strange, but they had a lot of names and you have to determine which one is right. Yes. I, this is such great information. So much the library yeah. and uh, the Valerie. Where again can we pull up this presentation? People from here can say this. We'll probably um, stop.
this in a little bit and you all can finish up your meeting. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can find uh, this presentation on the library's YouTube channel. Um, so just uh, go to YouTube and look for Carbondale Public Library and you'll see all of our programs and it's called Genealogy for Everyone. And um, I also, if you would like to send it to me, I could post the actual slides well, with links. Yeah. So that's... I have it on that. If you just want to okay. copy, I can copy it, it yeah. and then I could post that um, along with the video. So if you wanted to actually click and download, so you have, you could click on the links because in the video, you wouldn't be able to click on the links. So, yep, no problem. Okay, other comments? I have a question yes. about Skull 3. Yes. Does it include Confederate service records as well as Union? It has links to Confederate service records, okay. but it doesn't have usually, well, it has the, or yeah, it does have service records. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it, and you can see the service record is you probably in there if it survives. But, and there are served, there are pensions for service records on ancestry for Confederate pensions, but they take a little work to find because they're not the all indexed. Mm -hmm. But there are often, they don't have a lot of information, but often a widow applied for pensions, so it might identify the widow. But yes, there are lots of Civil War records, not the original sense, not the original pensions for Civil Wars at this time, but they do have the, those are, of the service records are online. Okay. Yes, on fold three. And the, some of them are indexed on Ancestry, so you might get a clue to what you're looking for on Ancestry. Yes, which, on yes. So and fold three, as I said, that's a little tricky because you have to think of how, if you didn't know how to spell this, how might someone have spelled this? Because they might not have used the spelling you're looking for, and sometimes they were initials, which were really a pain in the neck. When it's W.S. Phillips instead of, you know, then you don't know if it's yours or not. You have to find other records. Good question. Okay, any other questions? Thanks. <laughs>